Hello everyone and uh, welcome to re-entry. Uh, given the day uh, today and uh, the anniversary of the Vostok 1 flight, I wanted to uh, kind of spend some time in re-entry and perform uh, a similar flight myself. Uh, this is going to be using some uh, unreleased bits. Uh, I've never released Vostok uh, anywhere outside of my own hard drive before. I did uh, show it off uh, briefly at my 0 0.75 update uh, that rolled uh, out something called TSS for Apollo. TSS stands for the Truth Scale System and is basically an upgrade of uh, the game engine uh, in re-entry. It's uh, uh, an integration uh, layer between the physics engine and the rendering engine. Uh, but I'm not going to go uh, through all the TSS things today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Vostok and the Vostok 1 flight. Uh, so you can see up here that we're now uh, uh, on the 12th of April 1961 uh, and uh, we're a couple of minutes away from ignition. So this is the rocket and if I now jump into the cockpit you can see that uh, there's a couple of things in front of you. Uh, first of all, uh, Vostok had uh, two main uh, panels. Uh, one was uh, called the control panel, and you can see it here. It basically has a lot of uh, control uh, switches and uh, ways to interact with the different systems on board. And then you had uh, the main panel, uh, which has the entire signal light array. Uh, in addition to some indicators, a watch, a uh, globe view, and so on. In addition, there's a couple of other systems uh, located around inside of the cockpit that I'll basically go uh, through as we ascend and get into orbit. So, Vostok uh, was a quite short mi uh, mission. Uh, it was uh, the first manned uh, mission in space ever. And uh, uh, it lasted for a duration of about one orbit. Uh, today uh, we will be ascending uh, into orbit uh, on uh, this rocket. It basically has a few stages. It has uh, uh, four strap-on stages uh, surrounding a core stage in the middle. And then uh, it has uh, a lunar stage that will take the entire spacecraft the last bits into orbit. We'll go through some of these things that as we start ascending and uh, 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 getting those engines ignited. Uh, so before we do uh, anything here, I uh, wanted to just highlight uh, one of the really cool things about Vostok, and that's it's that uh, that's how automated it all was. Uh, I know that uh, probably a few of you has have been trying to fly the Mercury uh, sp uh, space capsule here in re-entry or maybe even in, in other simulators as well. In, uh, the, the Mercury capsule and Vostok are quite uh, similar in uh, some ways, but then again, very different in other ways. Uh, we'll go through a few of these systems once we get into orbit and some of the major differences. But one of the things that we can say about Vostok is that a lot of the systems and a lot of the operations here are fully automatic so you could basically fly this entire mission uh, fully automatic uh, if you wanted to but of course we're going to do some man manual overrides and we're going to take a deeper look into some of these systems as 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 the mission uh, mission proceed uh, but one of the things that you can do before ignition uh, is to uh, do a lamp test so you can just click this button and it will toggle all the light bulbs inside of uh, this main panel on. And you can verify that everything seems to be functional. There's uh, no indicators that has text but with, with no lights. And uh, yeah, everything seems to be in order. So now uh, we're about two minutes away from launch. I'm going to time scale to about 30 seconds before ignition. Right, we're 30 seconds away from ignition. And for the ignition, I'm going to start by external view and then I'm going to 
and then I'm going to jump into the cockpit itself. This might be a good view. 12 seconds. The ignition will happen now. There we go. Okay, I'm going to jump in. We can hear the uh, sound of these engines. And there we go. Uh, we have lift off. Lift off. And keep in mind that uh, a lot of these things uh, are bits that I haven't been working on for a very long, very long time. Uh, this is not the main priority uh, of reentry, uh, but I do plan, uh, based on the feedback from a previous video, to release this uh, to the public sometime after reentry has reached the 1.0 milestone. So what, after 1.0, I'm going to get back to this and, and start focusing on creating some of these things. But we should now be uh, ascending. If I now uh, kind of jump into the external view, uh, you can see there's uh, a lot of things uh, going on. Uh, but so you can see that the engines here are now uh, putting uh, a lot of thrust on this rocket and getting this up through the initial part of the atmosphere. About uh, eight uh, minute, uh, nine minutes past the hour, uh, these four strap-on stages here should separate and do their dancing maneuver and then the core stage will then continue uh, during the ascent. It's a beautiful, beautiful rocket. All right. We're getting close to uh, cutoff on the four outer stages here. There we go. And separation. core stage will now uh, continue its journey. Uh, you can see that there's uh, an outer fairing surrounding uh, most of uh, the, the spacecraft. If I jump inside now, you can see that the windows are basically blocked, except for my rear window uh, that has some view outside. It's quite dark, but you can see that this is the window you see, and you can see straight up here into space. Right, there goes the fairings, uh, which exposes uh, the Vostok spacecraft for the first time. It's a very different design uh, compared to uh, Mercury, uh, which is uh, kind of a similar spacecraft when it comes to technology, uh, but it does look really, really cool, I think. Uh, if we now get in, uh, you can see that the fairings has now uh, made it possible to look through the windows. Uh, we can see uh, outside the side view here. And then we can also take a look uh, into the visor, which is just a scope, basically. Uh, the scope has uh, two cameras. One is the center part, which is a uh, zoomed view. And then you have a kind of a fisheye view of Earth surrounding it. We'll get back to that later.
the ascent is uh, quite long. Uh, I think that uh, we should be doing the insertion at around uh, 17 minutes past the hour. And we're looking at Moscow time here. We do have a watch here, it should indicate a similar time here. So, right, we have staging. That's a core stage. Heading up. And uh, we're now uh, on the lunar stage here, uh, which will then take the spacecraft the final final journey into to orbit. The engine is quite small uh, and uh, the stage itself, but it uh, it will do the job. Uh, fine to spend some extra minutes on doing the final push. Uh, the watch itself, uh, as I mentioned, uh, does have hours, uh, minutes and seconds, but it also does have this uh, orbit view here, which shows you uh, where in the orbit you are on the day and night side and uh, the orbit counter here. Uh, we're aiming for a mission uh, of about one orbit today. Uh, we'll get into uh, a full orbit around Earth and then uh, we'll go th uh, around the er Earth uh, I think uh, around 70% uh, before we ignite those engines and then get back home. So once I get into orbit and the engines uh, are cut off, I'll spend some minutes on going through uh, most of these uh, switches here and this panel. And uh, I'll spend some time on some of these warning lights as well as uh, these indicators. And then I'll go through uh, these other things uh, on the side here. Okay, we're getting close. All right, and cut off. Okay, we should now be in, in space and uh, orbit and uh, we have staging. So what's rest of this spacecraft now is is this. And you can see that the antennas is now slowly coming out and unfolding 
and getting ready to uh, have radio contact with the mission control. Uh, it's going to spend about uh, 30 seconds to a minute uh, on completing this entire procedure. But as you can see, I didn't have to press any buttons or anything to do that. It was uh, fully ama automatic. But you do have manual control of the radio and uh, which of the systems you want to use. Uh, Vostok had uh, three main uh, radio systems. It had uh, one for UHF uh, and uh, two for HF. Uh, the capsule itself, uh, or the spacecraft, the Vostok spacecraft, is split into two different parts. You have the entry module, which is uh, this sphere on top, and this is what comes back uh, to Earth uh, when you do re-entry and landing. Uh, and then you have the instrumentation unit or module here, uh, which has a lot of equipment. And you can see that there are some aut automatic flaps that just opened. Uh, these are uh, based on the temperature and pressure inside of uh, this instrumentation unit. And uh, it's an automatic system, uh, but you can monitor this on uh, this panel here. Uh, right now, uh, you don't have too much insight into some of these instruments. You can see that, uh, for example, all of these are on zero. Uh, one of the things uh, worth noting is that uh, there's something called a gas analyzer, and that's this switch here. You basically push this all the way down to wind it, and then it will slowly fall back into the start uh, as it does the uh, gas analysis. So if I now uh, zoom out into a little bit fisheye and you take a look at these uh, indicators here on the trigorge uh, and I click the uh, gas analyzer, you can see that I get an uh, indicator showing that the gas analyzer is active and complete. Uh, usually I press a uh, couple of times on that just to, to verify, but they seem quite stable. Uh, what we're looking at here is that uh, uh, the top part here is the CO2 level inside of the cockpit and it goes from 0 to 4 percent and then you have uh, uh, the oxygen uh, amount uh, which should be around 21 percent uh, and then we have uh, uh, the pressure in atmosphere inside of the instrumentation unit so these are uh, good indicators to pay attention to but just remember that you need to update these manually by using the gas analyzer. Luckily it's quite simple, but it's something that you need to do. So sometimes if you take a brief look at this, the values might not actually reflect reality. But the sensors inside of the instrumentation unit here uh, is fully automatic, so it doesn't rely on this data. Uh, these will open and close uh, as needed uh, to maintain a set uh, temperature uh, and pressure. Uh, the other indicators that we, we see here is um, uh, this circle here, uh, which is mostly around the atmosphere inside of the, the cabin. Uh, we have uh, temperature. Uh, we can basically modify this here. If I set this to about middle, it should try to keep around 20 degrees. I think that this uh, temperature uh, controller here, uh, it goes from around 10 degrees of Celsius here and then and maximum around 28 to 30 degrees of Celsius here. So I'll just tend to put it in there in the middle and then uh, the conditioning system will of course try to maintain that set temperature and you can monitor this here. This one does not need a gas analyzer to function. And then you have the humidity, it should stay at uh, around 30%. And uh, the pressure inside of the cabin. Uh, the cabin pressure uh, is also fully automatic, uh, but you do have a warning light here. Uh, this one, which shows you uh, a red indicator if uh, the cabin pressure is low. And this is a critical uh, signal, which means that you also hear an alarm sound. Uh, this last indicator here is uh, uh, all about our propulsion system. Uh, we have uh, 
uh, three different propulsion systems. You have two for attitude control, and uh, this is manual and automatic control. Uh, and then you have uh, the uh, retrograde engine uh, here, uh, which uh, shows the pressure inside of this one. Uh, we'll get back to these uh, a little bit later in this uh, in the mission. First of all, uh, we're now currently uh, 0 0.1 uh, orbit into the mission. Uh, this is the orbit counter. It basically goes up uh, with a fraction uh, of precision. Uh, so if you've uh, done one orbit, this will indicate one. If you've done 10, then this one is one and then this zero. And this is uh, in between in the orbit, the, the, the current phase basically from perigee. Okay, and uh, we're having some center sensors uh, going that sir, but that's fine. That's uh, uh, there's uh, three things here on the signal panel. Uh, you have all these green indicators are here in the bottom, and you have some amber indicators in the middle, which is basically just information. And then uh, you have the red uh, signals here, which is uh, something that you need to pay close attention to or even correct immediately. Uh, I'll go through some more of these warning lights uh, later, but first I want to uh, spend some time on this panel. Uh, this is the control panel and uh, is your main interface with the systems that you can configure. Uh, it has uh, a few things. So I already mentioned uh, the temperature uh, uh, setter here and then you have the gas analyzer. But down here you have uh, uh, control of the globe. Uh, this is uh, the globe view you can see here. This one is not yet fully implemented, uh, implemented but it does uh, work. It's just that I've not been able to uh, program this one yet. You can see that I cannot press this. But this one will be used to configure this uh, globe device uh, uh, along with these two on the side. Uh, the globe can be uh, powered and uh, uh, then it has so this is basically uh, powering it on or off uh, so I can turn it on and then uh, there's another uh, switch here which allows me to uh, select uh, different modes of uh, operation so this is uh, the uh, orbital position and then you have uh, the landing position and uh, an indicator below this one uh, will be illuminated uh, when you set that but it, it basically rotates the globe to where it thinks you will land uh, uh, if you would burn uh, right now. But remember, this is a fully mechanical device and uh, uh, it's not 100% precise. But it can be configured uh, eventually. Uh, going down this panel, uh, we already touched uh, the light test and this is uh, a brightness uh, a knob for setting the brightness of them and then you have three switches here which allows you to shut the blinds on the visor and the side window and the rear window so now I'm going to go here and for example close all of them you can see that we're no longer able to look through the scope and the windows are also closed uh, but I'll keep them open for this mission. Uh, keep in mind that this is a visor, so this is the bright brightness for the visor. Uh, you can modify it here, uh, but it's not 100% uh, made yet. And then uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, uh, turning off the visor, but this is a visor, those two. And then these two are for the other blinds. Uh, going down the panel, uh, we have uh, uh, light control, uh, so we can, for example, uh, modify the lighting in the interior. Uh, we do have uh, four lights. Uh, one of them is the TV light in front of you. You can see that it's currently off. And then we have uh, one light here on the side and uh, one in the rear. They're kind of identical. And then we have a bigger, more ambient light here. Uh, which illuminates the entire cabin while these two others are more spotlighty. Uh, spotlighty. So uh, 
the only way to operate them is through this knob here and uh, this is uh, basically now set to working light which means that you're now working inside of the the uh, capsule you're doing stuff uh, experiments uh, whatsoever you need light uh, the other thing here is that you can go now into uh, a standby lighting and or night light so now I can I can just turn this one down a little bit you can see that uh, the brightness of those arrows are affected uh, and then uh, of course you have off uh, lastly and if I turn on the flashlight I can still see uh, but you can see that um, with off uh, it's gonna get very dark in in the cockpit so I'm gonna return to uh, ver working light and then you have the TV light here and uh, if I now turn this one on uh, you can see that the TV light is now working and it's illuminating uh, up into the cabin it's basically to illuminate the astronaut for the TV camera here but I'm going to turn it off because it's kind of annoying. It's very bright in front of you. The rest of these are for operating the, the radio uh, itself. Uh, you have uh, UHF and HF and uh, some volume things and, uh, and selectors uh, for the helmet microphone and stuff like that. It doesn't really make a lot of sense for some of these in the simulator, uh, but uh, uh, of course uh, once the radio are properly in place and uh, with this mission system uh, then this will be a bit more functional of course uh, then you have the side panel uh, the side panel is protected uh, by this cover uh, which prevented the cosmonaut to do some of these critical uh, things that you're able to do here uh, ho however they had a code they could use to unlock this thing and uh, I don't know uh, what's true or not, but I do think that the um, envelope was given to them uh, with the code so they could open it in, in case of an emergency or if ca in case they needed it. Uh, but the reason for this was that they didn't know how a human would react of be, uh, to being in space. If they would go mad or if something weird would happen, uh, then uh, there would be a, uh, some procedure required to do uh, stuff that would prevent you from getting back home. Uh, the code is 125 in re-entry uh, and this gives us access to all of these uh, switches here. So I can go through uh, uh, each of them. So the first one here is uh, for manual orientation. Uh, right now it's set to auto uh, but if you switch it up uh, you have manual attitude control of the spacecraft. Right now it's fully automatic. Uh, then we have uh, the descent mode 3. Uh, this uh, is uh, set to enabled, uh, but you can also set it to off. Uh, this will uh, enable or disable the automatic um, entry procedure system. Uh, we'll get back to that r uh, really soon. Uh, if you do disable that, uh, the uh, retrograde engine won't fire and if we now take a look at the spacecraft itself uh, before we get into the night side um, you can see that there's this hole in the bottom and uh, uh, it's basically where uh, the retrograde engine sits so it's part of the instrumentation unit and then you have these thrusters on the side uh, which uh, gives you attitude control so this one will just fire that engine manually if you need to. It's a protected cover, so you click it once and it will open. Uh, next you have uh, emergency oxygen and uh, uh, a way to disable the warning signal uh, that will be triggered by some of these things. Uh, once I enter this code, I'm now uh, having access to manually operating uh, the spacecraft and this is uh, what this amber indicator is telling me uh, this basically means that I have manual control of uh, not the attitude itself but of the spacecraft but if I do want to have manual control of the attitude I can set this switch to up 
uh, which means that I now switch from automatic to manual uh, when it comes to attitude control. And the spacecraft is using uh, uh, a rate command mode for attitude control, and that's the only mode available. It basically means that if I now uh, push the joystick forward, uh, it's going to, from the moment I push it forward, it will take about one second before the uh, thrusters will react. So if I now push forward, you can see that it is, you can hear that it took about uh, one second. Uh, since this is rate command, and if I now pitch, uh, for example, down again, you can hear that the thrusters are firing. I'm still holding pitch down uh, because that's the direction I want to keep maneuvering to. But once I release the stick, it will uh, uh, try to kill the rates. So uh, that's rate command. Uh, it will fire the thrusters until you get up to a predefined uh, angular rate. And then it will try to maintain that rate until uh, you release the stick. Uh, another thing that you can notice is that if I now set this back to auto and you look at the signal lights here, you can say that uh, this indicator in the bottom here uh, uh, tells me that you're in manual mode. So pay attention to this warning light because uh, you need to be aware of being in manual mode. Uh, and the reason for this is that you're going to be re-entering uh, pretty soon. and. Uh, Re-entry is fully automatic if this one is set to up. Uh, the automatic re-entry system has three indicator lights here. We're now on uh, descent phase one, and then we have still number two and three left. So if you now take a look at our timepiece here, you can see that there's this uh, index knob that rotates from 12 o'clock. This is its start position. Uh, and once uh, it, let's pretend that we're on a six orbit mission, for example. Uh, once you get into this last orbit, uh, this indicator will start. And then uh, once it starts, uh, we will get uh, this line illuminated, which means uh, phase one. Once we cross phase two, that's this line here, we will enter the next phase of uh, uh, entry preparation. Uh, there's uh, some things going on in the background here, but it's all fully automatic, uh, so you don't need to care too much about it. But there's some tests, and then uh, once we get into about 10 minutes before uh, phase 3, which is ignition, uh, it will do some testing of the automatic attitude system to make sure that uh, the spacecraft is able to maintain a retrograde orientation because you want to do uh, the retrograde burn in retrograde direction or else you're going to be going in the opposite direction which will increase your orbit instead of taking you through the atmosphere again. So that's quite an important procedure. Uh, this uh, will be functional uh, even if you're in manual mode uh, for even firing uh, the TDU. The only thing that you can switch to manual here because this is just an indicator basically and trigger the tests, but if you uh, switch it off, then it won't do all, uh, those things. Uh, but I'm going to keep it on auto, and I'm going to keep the mat uh, attitude control on a uh, manual still. I'm going to do a uh, gas analyzer. Okay. Uh, Next, I want to take a, a quick look at the visor. Uh, the visor has these arrows uh, that can show you in what direction you need to maneuver the spacecraft. One of the things that you might have noticed uh, relative to Mercury uh, or any of the American uh, spacecraft is that this one is lacking attitude uh, indicators, you know, a uh, mechanism to show what attitude you're at. Uh, the visor is uh, your tool uh, to be able to do that. It's uh, quite advanced, actually. Uh, it has, uh, it's, it's simply advanced, to put it that way. If I now uh, maneuver the spacecraft, and I, I'm going to get into a uh, retrograde direction, you can see from this external view here. Uh, we're now uh, on sunset. 
There we go. A little bit more corrections. Uh, you can see that this thing here is, is moving around. And the outer part of this scope uh, shows a fisheye view of Earth. And to know that you're now uh, correctly uh, in the roll amount is that if you can get the horizon of Earth uh, aligned around this entire thing, so you can basically see the horizon in every direction, of course this is easier when it's daylight, then you know that your roll is okay. Uh, another thing that you want to uh, be sure of is the direction that you travel. So for, uh, I'm just going to get into proper orientation here. For example, right now I'm facing uh, in this direction and there's some arrows here. And you can see that these things on Earth are traveling in the opposite direction of these arrows. This means that I'm facing prograde. So if I now uh, yaw and I start uh, rolling to the side, yawing to the side, uh, I want to do 180 degrees uh, so that I face uh, retrograde instead because that's the direction I want to burn the engine. And this is just manual preparation for everything. If I stop now, you can uh, see that uh, the direction of the uh, few things that you can still see on Earth in this uh, amount of light is uh, going sideways. So I still have about 90 degrees left. Okay. And then I'm going to correct roll a little bit. <coughs> now you can see that these particles are now traveling in the correct direction uh, relative to the arrows. But if you follow these particles, you can see that they're kind of deviating from these uh, lines. So I can still try to correct uh, my retrograde attitude a little bit more. There we go. We're now facing uh, retrograde and we're having the last uh, rays of light hitting the spacecraft still in the sunset. Okay, so now we're in retrograde. Uh, we should be fine. Uh, we still need to correct the attitudes a little bit more probably uh, once we get into the morning side of Earth. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is uh, this thing up top, uh, on top here. Uh, this was a piece that uh, weren't available on all the Vostok uh, uh, spacecrafts, but I kept it in here uh, because uh, it was still a tool that they used in some of the flights. Uh, it shows you your latitude, and uh, by looking at the movements of this, you can see that you're go. Are you uh, moving towards equator or uh, f uh, from it, basically? Uh, zero and uh, uh, is the at <coughs> uh, latitude and then you have the longitude down here uh, which is uh, uh, where you are on earth uh, this is your coordinates basically uh, <coughs> uh, another thing that's quite important to know is uh, what these indicators uh, or signals actually means so I'm gonna go through a couple of them uh, or at least the most important ones uh, so if we start from the top uh, the red indicators uh, when illuminated of course if I now turn on uh, the light test you can see that some of them are red some of them are amber some of them are green as mentioned uh, initially so uh, the top one here is uh, low cabin pressure. Uh, this is uh, that the CO2 concentration is high. Uh, that's this indicator here. And I'm going to do a gas analyzer to update that value. You can see that it's slightly increased, but we don't uh, have anything to worry about yet. This is a short mission. <coughs> this is uh, to fire the TDU or cancel the descent. Uh, this one is uh, gas on first descent. Uh, it basically means that you have enough gas to get back. 
and then you have uh, another call uh, one called prepare to catapult uh, this is uh, something that illuminates after separation from the instrumentation unit and it means that you need to prepare for re-entry and to leave the spacecraft uh, through that uh, ejection uh, seat uh, the, br uh, the entry procedures are quite brutal uh, the sphere will go through the atmosphere and then uh, it will eject uh, or blow the hatch below here and then eject this seat and throw it out and then parachutes will slow the seat down and then release the seat and you're gonna fall down uh, uh, through a main chute. So that's basically this one. If you see this, get ready to get out. And then this one is to remember to arm uh, the ejection seat because if you don't arm it, it won't go anywhere and that could be catastrophic. Uh, you have a device here uh, which uh, controls this. This is the power setting and this is the arm. So if you turn off the power, uh, it won't work at all. Uh, if, you, if it has powered, uh, uh, you will see the orange light and then if you turn on uh, the arm switch which basically arms everything then you're all ready so you should see these two lights uh, to know that you're ready for this uh, this one is if you turn off uh, the tone uh, when a warning comes uh, and then uh, you had the manual management here. Uh, this is uh, your uh, retrograde direction relative to a set angle to the sun. So you have some sensors, uh, sensors on the outside of the spacecraft. And uh, this one basically tells you that uh, you're now aligned with those sensors uh, at the correct time, at the correct angle relative to the sun. And if that happens, the TDU is ready to fire. So that's basically how the spacecraft knows that you're at the predefined location of when the automatic system should fire that engine. Uh, these green lights here uh, are the descent phase itself. Uh, you can remember a little, uh, we're now in phase two. <coughs> Uh, and then uh, you have UHF transfer, uh, you have gas analyzer, uh, you have manual orientation. We already gone through a couple of those. And then you have something called uh, uh, permitted TDU start, which basically means that uh, uh, the TDU uh, is now ready to be started. And you can do that uh, manually here. But remember, you can do that at any time, uh, not only if that uh, indicator is ready. This one just shows that the automatic would fire the uh, TDU and then so should you if you're on manual mode basically. So I'm gonna turn off the light lamp test and then uh, take a look at uh, these side things. So I already touched upon this uh, uh, arming device for uh, the ejection seat. Uh, we also have the attitude controller here uh, you have some uh, shells. I do think that uh, it that were quite mission specific on some of these contents and some of the fuses that you could be able to operate in here. And then you have uh, a radio here uh, that you can uh, do things with. You can uh, switch band. Uh, you can see on the side here you have C and then 1 and 2. And you can select which one of them you want to operate. So for example, if I select K1, I can move the radio thing here and I can turn on the radio itself. It doesn't have any signal. You can lower the volume if you want. But this one is actually hooked up to a text file uh, on the in the data folder on in app data. I'm going to turn it on <coughs> uh, in the app data folder for re-entry. And uh, there, uh, there's a text file uh, that then can control uh, radio stations that you can hook up with this uh, device. Uh, this means that you can open that text file and you can uh, have streams to your favorite inter internet radio stations. And you can uh, give them uh, what band it should uh, be on and then at uh, what frequency and then uh, save that file and uh, 
uh, and uh, when re-entry then loads it will uh, connect uh, your, the contents of this file with this radio so this basically means that you can hook this up to a lot of uh, radio stations however uh, keep in mind that you know when I'm doing videos like this that goes on YouTube or streaming then licensing on radio stations is uh, is a thing so that's why I'm not able to show this right now I think okay um, I do think that that was most of the main systems there's a lot of things under the hood uh, such as uh, electricity system uh, the ECS system uh, and things like that but I'm not going to go into all of the details uh, in this video uh, but keep in mind that this is the re-entry implementation of Vostok so uh, Vostok R uh, is what I'm going to name it it basically means that I do not have insights into how Vostok was operated in in real uh, some documents are available uh, most of them are in Russian uh, that's fine uh, but there's a lot of details that's uh, not available so this is just uh, you can basically call it a fictional recreation of what I think Vostok looked like uh, and my interpretation of the sources I have for uh, operating this craft but uh, you can see that uh, if you're playing other Vostok simulations there's going to be differences on this panel there's going to be a lot of differences on the indicator lights and uh, some even have added uh, more panels here with attitude indicators and stuff like that uh, but this is my uh, interpretation of it and I try to uh, keep it as realistic as I can uh, but of course there's a catch when it comes to the information okay so now I'm going to go into orbit view and I'm going to time scale a little bit, a little bit. and uh, we're coming up on below Africa here and uh, we are going to prepare uh, the entry procedures there's not too much to it we need to verify our orientation we're still quite good uh, we can do something about the pitch oops that was the wrong direction you have these uh, arrows here that could give you an indication of uh, what direction to move the spacecraft to get into the correct attitude relative to the sun uh, but those values will be a little bit weird if you don't have the sun uh, near you but now they should be working and I'm gonna shut off that radio okay and then I'm going to time scale a bit more since I'm in manual mode uh, the automatic uh, retrograde system uh, want to do the, the the actual tests the test here is that it would align it 10 minutes before ignition it would align the spacecraft with retrograde and if it couldn't do that then uh, it will uh, give you a warning and uh, you need to take over for manual right and that's uh, our queue uh, entry is within four minutes uh, I mean retrograde burn so I'm going to mute that sound and you can see that uh, if I now unmute it, that signal light uh, extinguishes. This means that we're close uh, to retrograde uh, and that we need to, uh, this one will get fired. Uh, or if you then switch down um, this one to off, it cancels the burn and you need to do that manually or uh, I think uh, recalculate it uh, based on some emission parameters from mission control okay We're now getting up to the day side Uh, 
uh, once this engine ignites uh, you will be able to see uh, the pressure here rapidly go down uh, until it's uh, sufficiently pressurized and then it will get ignited uh, there's not a lot of pressure in that uh, in it yet so it's gonna spend I think it's about two seconds or something before the actual ignition happens uh, because of that pressure difference Okay, we're getting close. This is uh, our queue. And it's cooling down uh, the instrumentation unit. for this light there we go it's building up pressure and ignition we can see that uh, uh, phase 3 has started we can hear the engine noise and we can see it from external view see the pressure is uh, decreasing slowly and it's going to keep on burning for a predefined amount of uh, time <coughs> or if something fails it's an automatic timer inside it that uh, will cut it off after a maximum amount of burn time to make sure that you don't burn too much and cut off. Now uh, the instrumentation unit will automatically be separated and uh, we should, uh, there we have uh, prepared to catapult. This means that we now staged from the instrumentation unit. And the strap is open and uh, off goes everything. And uh, what's left of us is this entry module here uh, that will automatically stabilize uh, since there's an offset of the center of gravity. Uh, it's uh, uh, it will automatically orientate itself so uh, you're facing with like bottom way into the velocity of the entry or the drag basically. <coughs> Prepare to catapult. Uh, let's verify this one. Always verify this. Uh, keep in mind that uh, this is, as mentioned, very early bits. So Vostok is still in a very early stage when it comes to a lot of these mechanics. You're already seeing that there's uh, some light balancing that needs to be done. Uh, missions needs to be created. Uh, but most of all there's still quite a lot of work when it comes to the re-entry procedures uh, when it comes from kind of a mechanical perspective uh, which means you know uh, getting through that atmosphere uh, there's some uh, cutting of uh, the visual aspects and then of course the landing itself on earth will need to be procedurally generated uh, but we're going to be landing in an area that basically looks something like this it's a procedurally generated height map but we'll see if it goes uh, it's uh, very early so that the entire re-entry procedure is unstable uh, anything can basically happen to put it that way who knows if our chutes will open or if our ejection seat will get out of the spacecraft properly or if even if we are going to get out of the ejection sheet uh, seat once uh, we're out of the spacecraft we'll see it's uh, exciting every time. It's uh, it's brutally hard to create some of these things, and it takes quite a lot of time to actually test them. But here we go. Uh, I'm going to time scale, 
until uh, we're over this territory. Okay, we're now uh, quite low on altitude, as you can see. The Earth is getting closer and closer. keep on time scaling. Uh, by the way you can also see uh, on the orbit indicator that we now uh, 0.9 orbits into the mission. Uh, our goal is uh, 1.0 uh, but that will happen on landing so always back to time scaling. stopped the time scale. You can see that uh, we're now facing uh, bottom first into the trajectory. This one uh, will uh, be burned off but right now I haven't actually modeled the visual aspect of that. I do not know if you actually had to close this for entry. I don't think so because I think the blinds are on the inside. And uh, we're going all the way from orbital velocities, so this will take a few minutes. Of course, obviously, if you've been playing re-entry before, uh, Mercury and Gemini or Apollo and you've done entry, uh, you can see that uh, the light inside of the co uh, cockpit is not affected from the outside. It should uh, show some glow inside of the cockpit itself. And then, of course, that entire rumbling sound effect and uh, uh, the camera shake is uh, also uh, missing. I want to do some cool things with that with some sound effects reg related to the bass and stuff like that to just create a cool ambient feeling. But as I mentioned, uh, this is scheduled for uh, sometime after uh, the zero point, uh, 1.0 release of uh, re-entry. So the main focus forward is uh, still Apollo for version 0 0.8 and then uh, some polishing and language uh, support typos and fixing uh, some missions in 0 0.9 uh, before we even get to the 1.0 phase among other things okay we're getting closer through okay we're through the upper atmosphere we need to double check our systems no extra alarm this one is the dangerous alarm 
So what will happen now is that this hatch will blow off and uh, then uh, we will catapult and I'm going to do this first person view but uh, you can do this external view as well. There we go. And it shoots her out. There she goes, capsule. And we're on our way down. And uh, this entire uh, descent is uh, quite slow. I haven't uh, been focusing too much on this yet. I've been mostly uh, doing systems. But eventually uh, this seat uh, should fall off and uh, we will descend through this cloud layer. So this last part will take uh, a few minutes and uh, I'll just leave it running so you can get kind of the full experience for now. And I'm still playing around with this library for this uh, volumetric clouds down here. Uh, it's very dense right now and it will bit, uh, become uh, quite dark clouds as we get closer and get through them. But that's uh, configuration. Yeah, I already noticed a big difference between 
playing this in the Unity editor versus an exported EXE, uh, which I'm doing for the first time right now. Uh, I see that this one uh, is falling down way too slow uh, based on on what I programmed it to, so I need to kind of identify that. It's probably something simple. Right, there goes the chair. It should have gone uh, earlier, uh, which means that we should now be on our main shoots. It's, uh, I haven't yet enabled two sided layers on that yet, but that will come. getting through very close to that cloud layer I'm gonna I'm just gonna run through this entire thing feel free to skip a little bit forward if you want to all right through some dark clouds as mentioned this are this is a big test and there's a lot of tweaking I can do with this library but I think that they do look quite good and if they work I might even roll this out to to Mercury uh, Gemini and, and uh, Apollo Alright, getting through. And the shaking is also a floating floating point thing. It's fully possible to fix that. Alright. Getting through that dark test cloud layer. See how this looks. It's dark. Uh, the reason this is so dark is uh, the clipping rage of uh, the camera for those who are into rendering here of course but yeah uh, the plan now is that this entire ground uh, will be procedurally uh, genera generated based on, on lookup data into height data of earth uh, and as well of color, color coding for different biotopes that we have uh, such as ocean, uh, grass, uh, highlands, mountains and you can have uh, different parameters to do that I'm going to continue to leave this running uh, to basically see what happens uh, and then uh, uh, end the video then uh, but 
uh, while waiting for that I'm probably just gonna end the voice part of this and say thank you for for watching uh, as mentioned this is a very early uh, build of Vostok it's uh, only available on my computer it's not something that you can play if you get into re-entry right now but um, uh, I do hope uh, based on the interests and based on the feedback I got uh, from my previous demo of this uh, on the 0 0.75 release uh, I've uh, decided that I do want to kind of give this a polish uh, give this uh, uh, some more uh, features uh, missions and uh, get it I uh, give it an academy uh, after uh, re-entry has reached uh, the 1.0 uh, milestone then I'll continue to work on this and package this up as a module for uh, re-entry. Uh, there's a lot of fun uh, things uh, to do in that, uh, that capsule. It's quite different uh, than Mercury, but you do have those... Yeah, there you can see uh, I've hit something. This is an invisible ground. Uh, anyways, I think that uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, fun stuff in that that capsule. Uh, basically, uh, if we if I enable, for example, random failures, then uh, you will need to shut that uh, automatic system off uh, for some of those things, and then uh, attend to those and take manual control and do manual re-entries. Uh, things like that but uh, of course that's for the future uh, right now I'm going to get back into Apollo development uh, I want to say thank you again for watching and uh, have a good afternoon